CROs in the industry about the whole impact of programmatic to organizations uh, and ask them some questions and then hopefully have some time to uh, uh, go to the uh, floor and uh, get some input from, uh, from you all. But uh, why don't I do this just quickly. Uh, name, company you work for, and then we'll hit it uh, right from there, okay? Jeff Doss at Demand Media. John Henderson, Answers.com. Ann Lundberg, Scripps Interactive Networks. Rich Sutton, the Mail Online. Lisa Valentino, ESPN. Outstanding. Alrighty, so uh, why don't we go in reverse order. Uh, Lisa, uh, your um, sales team, how are you uh, structured? And in particular, uh, what has the advent of programmatic uh, buying and the rise of programmatic buying from agencies, what has that meant to your sales team structure, if anything? Sure. Um, we, I could probably spend an hour laying out how we're structured because it's not the easiest. We're one of the most matrixed organizations I've seen. Um, but we are set up as a multimedia sales company, so we approach you know, every medium holistically um, from a sales perspective. We've invested in the programmatic space in the last year, and we've got specialists that work closely with some of the trading desks and other partners that um, that we work with programmatically. But, you know, we're not looking at it as a separate thing within our organization. It's very much interconnected to how our sales team goes to market, so. Great, and we'll go back on that and see how much it's bleeding across uh, uh, types of media, because uh, that's interesting, the structure you have. Rich, uh, kind of a contrast, uh, almost a startup in a mail online in the States, and. Uh, huge hiring spree last year. How much, uh, in terms of your hiring strategy, are you taking into account the whole rise of programmatic line? So we've got um, a person responsible for programmatic on both sides of the ocean. Michael. And then, am I not on? I don't know. Can you hear him? You got it now. How about now? Okay, All right, very good. Um, so we've got person responsible for programmatic on both sides of the ocean. And then in, the UK and in the US, we have someone who manages programmatic. But what we've seen so far is that the decisions about where budgets go get made at the planning and buying level. So you've got to make those calls with sellers anyway. Um, it's way more convenient to do it programmatically. It knocks an insertion order out of the system. So our, our sort of philosophy, if you will, is that if you can sell it programmatically, do it. Um, but the other side of the fence isn't quite there yet. Got it. And, and your, uh, your team, uh, in terms of uh, programmatic, I know that you are also kind of a cross-functional team as well. Uh, How has that impacted uh, uh, the organization, the sales? Well, matrix is, is a, good, a good word to use. Um, at Scripps, we have two, we are a TV-driven company, right, because we are cable. Um, so we have the home team and the food team on the TV side. We've actually divided our digital teams into home and food as well because we want to really be brand evangelists and partner very closely with television. But, of course, programmatic goes across the entire platform. And so that's kind of, um, while everybody in the sales team sells it, it actually all runs across all of our properties at the same time. So that creates complications. Um, we have a leader of our programmatic effort, Kelly Rourke, who's here today. Um, and she looks at it across and tries to build high-level relationships with all the trading desks and DSPs and, and manage that. Um, and then all of our sellers are also responsible for being able to speak to it and work it as it seems appropriate in their deals. Got it. Uh, and may I ask, is it, do you find it uh, amounting to real dollars at this juncture for your organization? Yes, actually. So in one year, um, I would say it's a huge, sort of a, from zero to 60 in one year, um, maybe a zero to 30 in one year. I'd like it to be sort of 30 to 60 in the next year. Gotcha. Um, but it's, it's been a big growth area for us, and it's a huge focus. Gotcha. And John, what do you think uh, in terms of structure for uh, the team? And it's an interesting, so you have uh, three companies that are established media companies, one obviously very early stage, but you know, uh, from established media companies kind of made for the medium. What, mm -hmm. uh, how's your approach to it and do you think it differs 
Um, so first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, Answers.com is probably the largest site that many of you haven't even heard of, right? So I just want to establish that. You know, it's not ESPN. It, it's not scripts. Um, it's huge, though. It's 70 plus million uniques a month in both desktop and, and, and mobile. And it's always the top 20 Comscore site. So I'm in a unique position in that I was brought on board five and a half months ago to literally start the direct ad sales team. So 95% of our revenue currently today is through the open exchange, through programmatic. So I'm the guy who's you know, brought on board to take it up you know, a notch to the private marketplace. And I know Doug had a, um, a panel this morning trying to figure out if, if the private marketplace even really exists. I hope it does. I, I believe it does. Uh, but from a... Your family does, too. And my family does, as well. <laughs> you know, no question, two kids in college. So, uh, you know, from a, a direct standpoint, um, you know, it's very important for us to get out there in the marketplace to put our stand in the ground. You know, so we're all about categories, whether it be sports, whether it be food and cooking, or whether it be health where student life is obviously very big for us. Um, you know, it's a scenario where I'm looking to balance that private marketplace and that direct marketplace with one sales team. I think it's very important for a salesperson and an agency as well to have, you know, one or two people calling on Group M with all of their M agencies and Saxis as well, you know, so they know what's going on and so there's some collaboration between the two. So it's going to be interesting times for us, absolutely. And uh, in your role, the... Um Decision on what inventory goes where that uh, falls in your desk. That's Correct. your ultimate responsibility for maximum monetization across all channels. Correct. It's all about yield, right? So um, right now, from our perspective, our only you know major monetization channel is the open exchange, and we all know what you know what those CPMs look like. So it's you know a step up and a step up again from a direct side. Gotcha. And Jeff, again, a great you know born and bred internet company demand. Uh, how are you guys uh, handling your sales uh, channels as you go to uh, market and monetize all the traffic? Well, I think the way we think about it, we've stayed, you know, lots of things are changing, but some things are staying the same. <clears throat> and we think of the brand marketer, the CMO, as our customer. So we're creating marketing solutions for our customer, the brand marketer, and the agencies that advise them. And that hasn't changed. So we've always covered... Uh, as part of uh, achieving act, our sales objectives, we've covered both uh, the brands as customers and the agencies as customers, and we view programmatic as transformational as it is in terms of new capability. Uh, we just think of it as a, um, uh, an additional solution. So we haven't restructured our organization. In fact, we've focused on one revenue organization, so we think you know, the, the CMO's requirements, the brand marketer's requirements as as primary, and over time, technology will enable us to bring a more a fuller spectrum of solutions, if you will, to help meet uh, those uh, requirements. And so, what we have done is added some resource, sort of back at uh, at the home shop, if you will, of uh, specialists in terms of enabling packaging, pricing, and the operational side of programmatic. But in terms of go to market, we want our sellers to have a holistic view of the customer's requirements and the products and services that we can bring to bear to help meet those requirements. All right, that's great, but that opens up a whole area, and I, I toss this out to everyone, because uh, you've all kind of touched on it, and that is if you're doing this uh, balancing act, and uh, you know, John, you mentioned how uh, the CPMs in uh, an exchange environment, uh, even with the great tools of a Podomatic or uh, SSPs, um, you're just not, we're not seeing what we would have hoped to have seen, you know, this, you know, five years ago now, you fast forward to today, and the promise was always that demand and supply would kind of get to more of an equilibrium. So now we're kind of faced in this world where for the foreseeable future, that's always going to have a lower yield. Maybe a higher fill, maybe in the end day, you get more revenue from it, and maybe CPMs is something that we shouldn't even be worried about. But now you have a direct sales team. And you have this thriving business going on over here that's growing up and to the right. How do you arm the direct sellers? What do you put in their bag uh -huh. that differentiates the inventory so that no one can make the mistake, oh, I'll never get that here on this exchange. I can only get that there. You know, what do I, you think, think? I think you've got to, first of all, define what you mean by programmatic. 
Because the way that we look at it, and the, the reason why we're participating in this space is because we define it as automation with data. It is not a CPM game. And if, you know, if it was a CPM game, we would not be in the programmatic space like we weren't in the ad network space. So if right now most of the, of the programmatic world is a translation of the ad network business, it's cheap, it's remnant, whatever, whatever word you want to use to describe it. I think we have an opportunity, though, if we look at it as a way to automate and create more efficiency around the transaction, regardless of whether it's digital, television, video, we have an opportunity to focus on our core business. You will never be able to transact the value of ESPN through a programmatic channel. You just won't. Are there efficiencies that through a technology world and through so much change that's happening that allows you to use the technology to glean insights, to use data in smarter ways? And to take resources, you know, it takes 50 people to get a $50,000 insertion order up live. You don't need 50 people to do that. It's yeah, crazy. 45. You need like two. So is it, we look at this as a way to change the game for us in terms of how we're organized, where we make our investment. We'd like to spend a lot more time in the CMO's office talking about how they solve their business problems. And we think this shift in the world is going to allow us to do that, which is why we're strategically being smart. But to me, my sales guys are out there selling the value of one thing, ESPN and sports and men. Mm -hmm. Right. And whether that gets transacted, most of the deals we've seen in the last 12 months that are programmatic were negotiated the same way we negotiate every deal, CPM, flight, placement, and transacted through our, our platform, which is powered by Google. Got Doesn't it. make sense to, to do, you know, and I, I, would, I would also, and I, I wonder what my, um, my uh, mates up here think, but, you know, the business model is not standardized right now. So what's the incentive for a publisher to take their reservation business and automate the whole thing when whoever's on the other end of that, whether it's, Google or another company is going to take a piece of that. So the, the marketplace hasn't decided all of the variables about who's paying for what. We haven't figured that all out in the digital space. Um, but yeah, I love the idea of moving this well, the, business. The buyers have figured it out. It's the publisher that pays. Yeah, they, me, exactly. Right? <laughs> but we haven't necessarily agreed to that. You know, so that's kind of no. It's good. That's helpful. Thinking. And I'm going to go back to something you said before. But uh, before I do that, uh, how do you do it, Rich? You're, you're building a brand new team. I'm sure you have excess uh, inventory as you ramp up. How do you how do you uh, convince someone that there's only something they can get through you that they can't get if they find it uh, on Pubmatic or Addicts or whatever the case may be? Yeah, well, it goes back to what both Lisa and Jeff said. You got a, a brand and a solution proposition, and if you can't get that across, then it really doesn't matter whether it comes across an insertion order or programmatically. If you don't have <laughs> A solution for that CMO doesn't really matter how the so transaction happens. So when you say happens. solution, not just making them aware of your brand, but you're saying, let's get down to like pixels. The solution is something that is relatively non-standard. Is that fair to say that uh, you said you weren't chasing RFP business, and so let's assume that it's probably not a bad assumption to think that the RFP-driven business of the sub fifty thousand IO for guys the size of you is probably going towards the world of programmatic and that's a, probably where it should be. Uh, but then what are you uh, selling that uh, is a solution? What it, 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 does that mean native? Does that mean uh, non-standard? Or you can sell standard at a high CPM, have that same standard unit on a exchange and somehow delineate it for the marketer. Yeah, so if what you're asking is how do you execute that solution? Yeah. It's all non-standard. And today, it's not available on programmatic. So whether that's native or it's content that we're providing for uh, a social agenda that the client has, or we're solving a business agenda through some type of delivery of return on investment, those units generally aren't standard. Can they be? Yeah. C 
could they buy those units programmatically? Yeah, they often do. Sometimes the, the deal will be 20% programmatically and 80% on an insertion order. At some point in time, that will change. Got it. Makes sense? No, it does. It Got does. It. What about you? Uh, I mean, I, a lot of what Lisa said is exactly the way we think about it. In our space at Scripps, you know, we have brands like Food Network and right. HGTV. They're um, very, very premium environments, lifestyle environments. Um, and, you know, our business, the bulk of our digital business, and, of course, television has always been very much premium driven. So, you know, for us, when we look at automation, we just say, hey, is it, at the end of the day, we need to maximize yield on our inventory. Um, we aren't going to have an endless supply, so we need to maximize the yield. So how do we do that? I mean, the vision of how that is in technology, you know, you always sort of see the future before it comes, and it takes a few years or 10 to get there. But our vision for it is, you know, one yield management platform, all sources of demand come in, we figure out what the best opportunity is, and, uh, you know, we figure out how to deliver the media there. And the sales team spends their time with the clients thinking about how to solve for their objectives and really use our resources and our brands and our talent and our capabilities to, to surround them. The implementation of that, you know, in a few years, I can't wait till it's automated. In the meantime, it's sort of, you know, hashed together. Got it. Got it. So we're kind of drawing the line between programmatic being equivalent to a bidded auction place to programmatic being plumbing that just makes uh, uh, transactions more efficient and deliberately. Yeah, del yeah like we don't have a runaway impressions business. Right. You know, you know, where you have like, I don't know, the, maybe the Weather Channel would be an example where, you know, it's, it's uh, a, a hurricane. You got a lot yeah. of impressions in a hurricane, but we don't have a lot of hurricanes at Food Network. <laughs> at Paula Dean, but I won't go yeah, there. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so guys, you, you Kind of a different situation, private equity owned, right? Uh, public. Uh, man, you know, quarterly matters. Uh, not that it doesn't matter to you guys in the slightest, but, you know, live or die by it. Do you ever find yourself wanting a mulligan in terms of a deal you cut that was automated uh, at a lower CPM and you wish you had that inventory back to do it at a higher? Or? Well, I'd say we, we're, we are constantly learning and trying to do better going forward. But our, our view on this is that it's, it's really, there's a lot of change going on in the industry, but whether that change creates risk or opportunity is, is much about the choice you make. Are you gonna embrace change and thrive, or, you find, or do you see it only at risk and you try to protect the businesses you were in in the past? And I think, you know, for those of us who've been in the industry long enough, you know that trying to fight logical trends makes no sense. <laughs> The creation of marketplaces that enables transparency so that products and services are ultimately priced correctly, priced to market, is an opportunity. Programmatic or automation is an opportunity for us to unlock value in our, in our audience. Not, uh, and to the extent there's cannibalization uh, that may occur, if, frankly, if, as a publisher, whether it's us or anybody else, we were asking of the market, asking of brand marketers to pay a price above the real value of that product and service, shame on us. So if the application of technology creates a marketplace in which light, uh, products can be exposed in terms of their value add and, the, and they find the rightful market price, that's a market that can grow. If you keep understanding CMO or brand marketer requirements, and you keep crafting solutions that address the shorter term and longer term objectives of a marketer, ultimately your market opportunity grows. And that's our perspective on it. So if there's some disruption, if there's some cannibalization or some change, let's go at it. Let's make that happen sooner and, and better and be, be an active participant. Let's unlock value of our audiences, not hide it behind this this dichotomy between there's only premium branded and there's rest of that's liquidated at the lowest price. There's a lot of valuable audience that, they, that brand marketers want to connect with existing or prospective customers. We have that audience, and if we can ex like, uh, extract the value by identifying the, the context within uh, which this audience exists, the, the uh, behaviors associated with it, some of that inventory will sell at higher rates. Some that was packaged, frankly, inappropriately at a higher CPM, that will change too.
But overall, but is it I think kind it of fair to say though that your direct sales team? Uh, and I'm just trying to drill down to like the practical okay. every day because I think a lot of folks in the audience would benefit from that because of the size and the scope of the organizations you guys run. Is it safe to say though that from a trend line standpoint, direct sold channel is becoming more and more of a non-standard channel? Is that safe to say in your business? Well, I think that to the extent, well, first of all, I think marketplaces will, with the addition, or the aid of technology will, will evolve, and more and more products with more and more uh, sophisticated attributes will be uh, available within that marketplace. So today, there's only a certain type of inventory that's available in uh, programmatic or in, in automated marketplaces. I think over time, just like we saw in financial markets, more and more sophisticated products will be available. But I do like the idea of, again, focusing on the needs of the marketer, and understanding the right product, the right service packaged in the right way and the right price being the thing that motivates everything we do every day. And that's why we unified as one revenue organization. We have only one you know, revenue goal as a company, then by region, then by seller, made up of however, you know, the full spectrum of products and services. There's no incentive or disincentive at the seller organization to, to focus on one or the other. The idea is to listen to your customer. Like we overcomplicate this. We need to listen to our customer, understand our customer, and craft marketing solutions that enable them to connect to their audiences. No, fair and, enough, and but so, if, your customer, if your customer points in the direction of the trading desk, uh, that's not a good thing, right? I mean, so that's you know, listen well, to your Well, it depends what they're asking for. If you haven't, you have to create a reason for them to have that conversation with you. Because I understand your requirements better, so I want to craft a unique solution for you, made up of some things that may be non-standard and many things that could be standard and would benefit from automation. That's why I see it ultimately as a as an opportunity to en enable the uh, the is like to keep educating our sellers to be uh, more uh, better listeners and better solution crafters. They they'll spend more time creating value and less time you know, down in sort of the you know, operational I, details. I'm, as I'm listening, I'm thinking that, you know, salespeople are optimistic by nature or we wouldn't do this, right? We have high expectations. We ask for a big number. We get a littler number, but we probably do better than the average. So I think when we think about the future of programmatic, we're very optimistic about what this could do for us in building demand and increasing the liquidity of the market and allowing more money to come into our properties. In the, in the now, I think it's it's pretty obvious that the demand side of this has a bit of an advantage, right? Because especially on the brand side, they haven't activated that much. There's not as much demand for premium brand content in this platform as I think there will be. And so as a result, as a supply owner, you know, I think really hard about what supply I'm putting in because I'm not confident that there's enough demand there to actually prop up the price. It's kind of like I'm putting my house on the market in January in a blizzard where I really want to put it on, you know, in July when people are thinking about starting the school year. Right, right. So I think right now there's that challenge. But yeah. sort of the vision is that that will go away. And that's kind of the, the, that's kind of, uh, the real challenge that you find yourself in your roles because... You're managing for today, you're managing for maximum revenue, yes. but you're also trying to plan for a future yes. where who wouldn't want a more automated world? John, what do you, how's your team? So, um, just to step back a minute. So before I started at Answers uh, five months ago, I spent the previous six years doing the same thing at TripAdvisor. So I was hired at TripAdvisor six years ago to literally build the direct ad sales team. And over that six year period of time, I spent literally, you know, maybe 10% of my time thinking about programmatic and 0% of my time literally acting in programmatic, right? So just like and just like Lisa, it was a big brand, um, you know, commanded huge CPMs and, you know, we had a, a niche audience in the travel vertical that, you know, was willing to pay for that audience, right? So now I find myself, you know, doing a little bit of a 180. And for me, it's, it's, it's more about the advertisers that we speak to and what their goals are and what their plans are, what they're looking for. So from, from my perspective, it's only up from 100% open exchange programmatic business now where we can then listen to them and give them more, right? So what more can we do from a direct ad sales perspective? So, you know, we've got tremendous amount of traffic in, you know, eight or nine verticals. 
So right now, on the programmatic side, it's just about ROS with maybe a little bit of third-party data. So every once in a while, you see a Nissan ad on an automotive page, right? But that's infrequent. So now we step that up to be able to add in some other third-party data to it. Um, and from a, from a direct sales perspective, um, you know, we hold back the big ideas. We hold back the answers brand page, we hold, which is completely owned um, by the brand. Uh, where they can interact one-on-one -on -one with a huge user base that comes into their Answers brand page. You know, Facebook has sponsored stories. We have sponsored answers. So if it's literally questions about specific brands, like, for instance, uh, you know, we were working with Toyota. And anybody want to guess how many times Toyota is referenced in our database as, you know, one word in a question? Just a guess. So some people would guess 3,000, 5,000, over 300,000 times the word Toyota is in our database. So we're able to work with Toyota to reach people that are literally looking or asking questions about those brands. So from my perspective, it's just to sit down, listen to the client, uh, figure out what they want to do. It could be as simple as keyword targeting. It could be as simple as um, you know, sort of a, a sponsored answer where your ad is between a question and an answer of total relevancy. Um, and we do it at scale. Right? So for me, it's, it's literally arming the direct sales team with the right ammunition to be able to have a conversation which you obviously can't have in the open exchange. And I'm hoping, you know, in the private exchange, it just makes it a little bit easier for everyone. So we don't give them all the tools that you would have from a direct sales perspective, but we're able to initiate third party and first party data. So at the end of the day, with the scale that we have, it is about audience and data. So it seems consistent that there are no fly zones where you would never consider having that go out for bid in an open marketplace. Uh, You'd be delighted to have ads transacted through pipes, uh, mm -hmm. but all things being equal, that's your essence of your brand, and it's not ever going to be in a biddable environment. You're going to set the price there. Uh, sometimes that's wrapped up with standard. Oftentimes it's wrapped up with non-standard. Uh, but then there is a threshold by which you're comfortable with some inventory being out just to fill the the inventory. So everybody talks about the barbell. Yeah, and it's then the uh, yeah, and trying to stop it floor three before you get to the basement, right? Um, so, Lisa, you mentioned data, and so that's really important. And so one of the theories that uh, we had when I was in the space, when I had a job, um, was, uh, <laughs> was, uh, you have a job today. <laughs> that's exactly, how am I doing? Very good. <laughs> Thank you. It means a lot. Um, uh, data. So uh, we talk a lot about third-party data. We see that actualized with every trade on every exchange. Uh, the hope was that there would be this trove of first party data that you all would have that would be so proprietary to you that no one can get a hold of that. And if you brought that to market with your media coupled, mm -hmm. and they can't decouple it and you're not going to sell your data, then man, maybe that breaks through and people recognize that. And maybe even append their own data, Walmart brings their own data to it, but they right. say that's worth more. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing that at all? We're seeing um, the be I think we're seeing the beginnings of it. I mean, we at, at ESPN, our conversation right now is half of our half of our uniques every month are registered. So we actually have gold that we're sitting on. Are we monetizing it to the best of our abilities? I would say no. But we're having really good conversations about what do we do with the data? Do we need additional resources um, to monetize the data? What other access do we have across the Disney organization? Because we've got moms, we've got kids, we've got other aspects of you know America under under our umbrella. So um, I think it's really important. We we have relationships with lots of third party data companies, but at the end of the day, they're bringing that to the table anyway. Right. You know, I mean, for the for some of the folks that are going into the private marketplace. Um, you know, it's not that it's not as valuable to bring third-party data, except that you have a better understanding of your audience and what that segmentation looks like, so you can value that. But they're bringing those sources to the table. So what you can bring are the insights from a first-party data, and I, I think it's beyond the demo-type stuff. I think that you know, from our perspective, folks want to know about how men are consuming media how the next generation of sports fans 
are consuming multi-screens and what does that mean and what are the implications and what are the trends that you're seeing ESPN and, and having that kind of consultative dialogue. Um, you know, our, our, a lot of our sports over-index against Hispanics. That's a really important segment for many of our customers right now to understand. How can we play a role in helping, you know, marketers so better understand? So are you understand? finding that, is so, it kind of just a company inertia, a huge company that's having difficulty unlocking or is this a, a tech solution that no one's knocked on your door and said, uh, wow, <clears throat> you can extract that, you can couple that, and you can bring it to market? And if that's part of PubMatic's pitch, I'm sorry. Obviously, PubMatic <laughs> no, can I do think that, it's, I think it other is, than PubMatic. I think it's figuring out how, first, it's, it's using the data to inf in influence the conversation, and then it's figuring out how you act on it. How do you productize it? And we're in that productized Got phase. Um, but I don't think you can ignore Taking the other two curve. steps. Those are really valuable that you, you just can't you know, get through a platform. So we're, we're seeing two things, Michael. One is, <clears throat> for folks that we're doing big sponsorships with, they're very interested in first party data. And we've got 86 off the shelf behavioral segments and we can carve them in all kinds of different ways and shapes. But if we're out talking to <clears throat> a trading desk, they, they don't know what to do with our data yeah, because it's right. not defined the same way everywhere. So if now everybody it's to something that might be very valuable to direct sales team, it's now it can be sold by a human to human, but very difficult right. to convey through pipes. <coughs> if right? if, if everybody job. defined it the same way, right. it wouldn't be difficult to sell. And I think. Well, I don't want to speak for everybody on the panel, but I sure believe first party data is way more valuable than third party because you know all the attributes and you can point to them and say, yep, that's got 30 days recency. Yep, that's from that URL. Yep. Third party data is tough to do that with. Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, you know, we have a treasure, treasure trove of first party data and we certainly utilize that data, the insights about the you know, in tender segments that interact with um, our content on eHow or LiveStrong or Cracked, et cetera, um, we're a little frustrated uh, that the technology isn't where it uh, needs to be yet to be able to expose all of that power in a more automated, more efficient buying model. But I'm absolutely confident that there's, a, there's, uh, there's innovation underway today that will enable us to really to expose, make more transparent the value of our audiences through, in, in large part, our first party data and do so in a responsible way uh, that retains value appropriately over time and will take <coughs> advantage of automation. We're frustrated, if you will, that we can only really reflect that in more custom, bespoke solutions. Um, and I look forward to the opportunity of unlocking the value of inventory of audience that brand marketers want to connect with in these very specific intention-oriented environments that we can't yet put through programmatic. But absolutely, it's a classic example, I think, of, of in some ways overestimating the impact of programmatic in the short term, but vastly underestimating its impact in the long term. I, I really yeah. believe it will be a huge growth driver in our business. Uh, you know, There's, I'll give you an example because something that we're dealing with right now is in the mobile space. So, you know, for, for, for our, our category, the mobile screen is by far, you know, a very powerful screen. On weekends, it's likely the first screen. And it has it flipped for you digitally? I don't know if you it, state it's, that it's publicly. Become a, it? It's become a significant business for us. You know, but I mean, not just from a revenue standpoint, from a use standpoint, do more people access ESPN content through a tablet or a mobile device than they do through the PC? Absolutely. You know, on weekends, we see our mobile usage, you know, um, going way past our, our dot-com usage. So we're seeing those trends on the usage side. We're seeing the revenue start to follow. We're seeing marketers get more and more advanced in terms of how to really create advertising for mobile screens. And yet you've got this surge of mobile programmatic conversation happening, but they, you can't unlock the value for all the reasons these guys are talking about of mobile. So you've got this really low, low CPM business that's accelerating. It's like a freight train. It's just coming out and the CPMs are just going down. And, 
folks are saying, do we jump on? What do we do? Do we expose mobile? And is that what we want to set up in terms of the value proposition that this screen or this meeting that we all believe in can deliver on just because the technology is, is just forcing it to go as a race to the bottom? So, you know, in our case, we've actually selected not to expose certain pieces of inventory like mobile or video. So mobile is out of the exchange Not, not until we think it's, right. it's the right environment for us to get the right value. So just like mobile kind of jumped that first generation of kind of that network creation and then to automation, it certainly jumped to uh, uh, programmatic in, uh, in exchange. And uh, you're saying the benefit is yet to materialize at all from a publishing yeah. standpoint. You know, there's a, you were asking about data, and one of the leaps that I think was really helpful uh, to me at Cafe Mom before I came to Scripps and here now at Scripps is that our data is extremely valuable to us for a retargeting strategy. So, you know, an application where right now we would use it is, let's say, a particular advertiser, or maybe it's Ziploc, has a relationship with Rachel Ray. And maybe we're building some kind of integrated custom experience with Rachel Ray on our sites. And, but then we're using these ads as an invitation for the consumer to engage with Rachel and Ziploc. And we're targeting those ads to users all over who've ever engaged with Rachel Ray, who've used her recipes all over scripts and beyond. And, and beyond. So yes. So, so we can important. take our yeah. data, which is our primary exclusive yep. data. Only we could ever do and that yeah. for a client. And we can go out into the marketplace and find those users and serve them content with Rachel that we know they're going to enjoy and get deeper level of engagement using the That's perfect. And that was the next question. So you are now a buyer, uh, yeah. a, a programmatic buyer. How do you train your sales team to sell that? Because That's, that's easy for them. Yeah, but uh, it's hard to guarantee. How do you know you're going to find the person? How many are you going to find? What kind of size package do you Yeah, sell? you know, you get better at it, though. Yeah, you just It's just not that hard. They, okay. That's the easy part for them. The hard part for them is that they're saying, well, wait a minute. If you free up, I don't know, I'll pick it, you know, General Motors, and yep. you put them, you know, on the, in the exchange, you know, that, well, how am I ever going to sell anything to them again? That's, that's an, a much harder conversation Finally, than to give them the power to re-reach our user uh, elsewhere and extend that. How do you, structurally, how do you do that at your company? You have one kid that's we actually have wacky, our, yeah, we have, fire kind of guy <laughs> buying <laughs> trading for you. Kind of, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. We've got a bunch of really smart data people, you know, who really think hard about what we own and how we can leverage it and who we can partner with to build segments on and off our site. And not to get too close to specifics, but is it a safe assumption that generally speaking the price point of that media would not be the same as O and O safe. targeted safe. Gen general. But nice arbitrage. Yeah. Ooh. Barb. <laughs> Barb is not dead in premium publishing, is it? Uh, that's great. What about you guys, Rich? Are you guys buyers? I mean uh, Yeah, we're we're definitely buyers of video because while we're if you believe Comscore, we're the biggest, you know, video distributor in our space. The demand is is there, so we definitely buy a lot of video. And in certain segments, we retarget. So, it, you know, in, in certain narrow uh, audience segments, we'll retarget. Got it. Do you guys uh, are you buyers? No, not at all. We don't. No. Um, you know, with the scale that we have, we can chase people around different you know categories within uh, within answers and. You know, just to regress for a second, um, you know, I agree with Ann and what, what Lisa was saying before, coming from Sony and coming from TripAdvisor, you know, there are certain things that you just don't want to do and expose those brands to, right? But it answers, it's a different story, right? So I feel that, you know, now again, a 180, it's more today with the answers about where the rubber hits the road. It really is about finding that right audience, that right user, and either it's on a, a, a private exchange or it's on a direct sales perspective, but we're not having those conversations about you know moving audience from um, you know TV to to tablet. You know, it's more about helping them just sort of sell product on a very transactional level. Richard Rad is here. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it was a good year at the, the mail, huh? <laughs> that was a very good year. Uh, uh, so we officially have no time, but I would imagine, though, if there are questions, the great folks from Pubmatic would be delighted to go a little bit over. Uh, we have a mic in the middle. 
Um, and I got a lot of people looking at the bar, so <laughs> that's probably not good. Um, any questions? I see any hands raised? Doug Weaver. Yes, Straight Doug, up. please. Yeah, actually, a question and a comment. Um, so, Lisa, your comment at the beginning of the panel when you said, um, yeah, look, we're never, you know, you're never going to be able to buy CPM and negotiate CPM through <coughs> trading functionality with ESPN, never, never, never. That was very clear. Um, <laughs> but what was interesting was, so if you set your price based on a CPM and an advertiser comes to you and says, okay, Lisa, so I'll pay your CPM. I'll pay what you think, you know, that, that space is worth or that user's worth. Um, but now I want to bring my own data into play and I want to programmatically match my customers. So if I'm American Express, I want to be able to know whether that's a blue card customer, green card customer, or whatnot. Do you just allow them to do that as a as a service? Do you you know do you as a premium for that? I mean, mm -hmm. have you given some thought to that kind of pricing? Yeah. So um, just so I can kind of guardrail my comments in the beginning, there there's so much that is beyond media that that we're doing business with that we're transacting with our customers every day that it's just not tangible that you can you know transact that through a platform you know you m our business is a multimedia sponsorship business and there's just a lot of value that gets unlocked that's beyond media so i just think we're in this very unique place not to say that pieces of our business won't get done programmatically but to think about you know the value of a uh, sponsorship on ESPN through a programmatic channel is just tough. Um, so in the cases where we do go programmatic, I think that is the opportunity. I think the, I, I don't think we're we're up here because we want to be transparent and we want to lead and we want to figure out what is the right way to define this this new opportunity as opposed to be afraid of it. This is the world we live in. And I think the more that we can connect American Express's customers to ESPN sports fans, there's a lot of value in that. Yes. And, and, and that's, you know, we see a lot of growth there, so. Uh, the, the comment I wanted to make also was that the headline for me on this panel was, we've, we've talked for a while about decoupling uh, programmatic from RTB. What just happened for me was kind of decoupling programmatic from bidding entirely. Yeah. Doesn't mean bidding is not a functionality you can have if you want to light up that API, but it means that really everybody should be doing this, if for nothing else, than for process automation, mm -hmm. right? So that's sort of the starting point we can all have. Exactly. And then we build from there based on our own unique business needs. And if we want to light up real time bidding or private marketplaces or what have you, those are just all functionalities <laughs> that we can turn on. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Lamb. So the question was uh, from Rachel Lamb of Time Warner. Uh, would, uh, is video available, I would imagine, from Scripps and ESPN? Uh, is video now available at all on the exchanges? No. And if not now, when would you make it available? So for the Scripps answer, the answer is not now and, <coughs> and certainly not. She tried so hard not to do that. Uh, um, not now, but Rich. not never. Not now, not never. Um, you know, you would never say never if we can find a way to, to trade and find mm -hmm. value and, again, demand, you know, command a premium on video Do sales through that platform. you work with any third-party agents right now? Not stuff. now, but we are looking at it hard. Yeah. Are you looking at Tremor at all? Because that's Rachel's company. <laughs> <laughs> It's just she's trying and to I mean, get to and it. the question, you know, can we when just cut to it, Rachel? Could you just do this <laughs> offline be because it's really just kind of <laughs> rude. <laughs> I mean, and, and even with you know, with television, it's not you would not never yeah, think about. Listen, this. I'm not prostituting myself, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but <laughs> do I don't this have afterwards. A job. <laughs> uh, Lisa, we're not now. Not now, and not really ever. Who knows? Who knows? Exactly. <laughs> oh, we <clears throat> far right. <laughs> yeah. So, I, if I understand, go ahead. You have a mic. Yes. So, uh, my question is for Lisa and other members of the panel. 
Uh, how do you use the data uh, to track consumers across different different mobile platforms? You had spoke about uh, you know they're using desktops now to tablets and to mobile, uh, but how does that integrate in terms of your plan? Uh, well, sir, first thing I'd say is there's lots of technology and partners that help us do that to make sure. I think it's a really important thing we've talked about. We think we saw three or four times the slide of during the daytime and evening, the different usage of uh, smartphone, tablet, and uh, desktop web connection. Um, so we, we use the technology providers and some in-house technology to do that. But again, we sort of zoom out again to that, that what the value for us is to create a, a, a scenario or a solution for a marketer who's trying to connect with uh, existing or prospective customers through that journey across device throughout the day and over time. Because when we craft solutions that do that, which enable them to ideally present the right ad creative to that user on that device in that context, in the broader context of the consumer journey, that's gold. That's gold. And that's why we look to our partner, our technology partners, to continue to enable these scenarios which actually have been in place for a long time. Like we've been asked for those solutions from brand marketers for a long time, and we are part of the solution. Our technology partners are part of that solution, but that's, that's where value is created in the application of ad technology to the businesses that we've been in for years as publishers. Or, uh, yeah. I, but I, I would I, imagine it's made so much easier if you have registered users, right? I mean, it, it helps. It's a lot easier. I mean, in the video space, we work with Freewheel, and they serve our video. We sell, we sell one video product across every screen. And it, got, it takes you know, the marketplace to get used to, well, I just want to buy or I don't want to buy. No, this is your, you want to buy the sports fan and you want to buy the behavior and you want to take advantage of the behavior. And so we want to mirror our products to be able to you know, mirror it to that behavior. So. We're doing it in the video space. I think we're going to go through a big redesign in 2014. And the goal is through responsive design and other, and other techniques to be able to not sell a web or a tablet or a, you know, a, a smartphone. It's, it's one behavior. And we want to be able, so I, I think there's some technology we'll take advantage of as well there. Well, outstanding. Thank you so much, panel. You were terrific. <laughs> And uh, thank you, audience. And I think the bar is open. Thanks.